I'm Eugene Costello and uh, first of all I'd just like to say that I'm sorry that I can't be there in person uh, today um, it's because uh, it's my uh, cousin's wedding so I have to go to that and anyway as it turned out yesterday um, as you may have noticed I was having kind of internet problems so it's probably just as well that I didn't give my talk yesterday anyway um, so I'm going to talk about um, pastoralism in uplands as a social practice so livestock rearing and what that meant for people uh, in rural communities uh, at a social level and looking at a couple of different things um, for example issue of commons you know and common usage of uplands uh, gendered labor in herding practices and how that all fits into the you know the rural landscape and I'll be focusing I suppose you know there'd be a good bit of stuff on Ireland but I will be drawing a bit on um, Scotland and Scandinavia as well uh, so I'm at UCC at the moment but I'll be um, moving back to Sweden um, uh, next month um, to Uppsala and uh, Stockholm so for you know many people today um, uplands are perceived in a way in which they they wouldn't have been in the past so they can present people with um, you know uncertainty um, as regards you know uh, getting injured potentially um, if people are hiking um, if there's bad weather um, and if mountain rescue needs to be called um, so there's a possibility of injury in these places um, in northwest Europe it's not the Himalayas but still it's kind of um, it's not um, uh, a normal road or a normal landscape um, where you wouldn't have anything to fear uh, physically and in the past that would have been the case too and even more so um, because I suppose people didn't have access to um, health care it wasn't a guarantee um, so if you broke your ankle then well you were you became a liability for the community then you became someone that had to be looked after so um, there was I suppose in a way risk taking was frowned upon um, more so than it would be today uh, when it comes to you know um, hiking and, and stuff like that um, in Sweden too there is you know I suppose it's a very different landscape uh, people talk, use the word utmark which means kind of outland uh, and there although they would be hilly um, what mainly characterizes them would be their um, forest a boreal forest of spruce and pine so um, these also are, shall we say, you know, look distinct from much of the rest of Sweden, you know, urban Sweden or lowland parts of Sweden. Um, so like uplands in Ireland and Scotland um, and in Iceland, they are kind of, you know, seen as a bit different. And certainly as places that were maybe less, uh, less human. And, you know, some of that is kind of reflected in the oral traditions that have come down to us um, from the you know late 19th and especially the 20th centuries from various countries in Northwest Europe and you know there's lots of stories which kind of suggest that um, upland areas were kind of um, places where weird stuff was more likely to happen so you have stories about wolf attacks um, for example you know people being alone at night in a herder's hut in the uplands and being attacked by a wolf other times the wolf can be more metaphorical and it is ends up being actually a young man um also you've stories about the uh, kailach or the you know hag appearing at many sites in ireland and the hebrides um you know scaring or cursing people um, in the uplands who are acting as herders of livestock and also of course you have this you know this is a very common European wide story of uh, either uh, the hag or a devil coming and stealing milk from a cow um, because they have taken the form of a hare or an animal um, so that allows them to sneak in and uh, take uh, the milk stealing the milk which was obviously a very precious commodity and then as well at times you have these kind of stories which are a bit weirder which are related to the Achishka, the water horse uh, mainly in the western isles of Scotland um, 
and then also related uh, to the Nenny in Iceland. So basically this was a very supposedly dangerous creature that um, if you were caught alone at night, um, especially at night in the uplands, um, then this creature was something to be feared and could uh, potentially kill you. So that's the kind of, I suppose, popular perceptions of it that you get um, from a very basic survey of the folklore and maybe our own perceptions today. But if we look at uplands through a variety of sources and maybe going a bit further back into the past, um, we can see that they were actually important places uh, socially and economically um, in a real way every day for people. So, you know, not just folklore, but also historical maps and documents and archaeological survey. And one of the reasons why they were so important, as I already hinted at, is that they were used for livestock grazing, particularly cattle and also sheep and goats. Um, so this practice is called transhumance, and essentially it involves the seasonal movement of both people and livestock um, between two different environmental zones and in this case we're talking about um, lowland areas or valleys or coastal areas uh, and then um, more distant um, upland areas that don't necessarily need to be that elevated but nevertheless are different environmentally because um, they tend to be either forested or uh, which the lowlands wouldn't be are they tend to be um, quite open and covered in, in bogland, which the lowlands or many of the lowlands wouldn't be either. So this practice of seasonal movement uh, appears strange to us now, but at the time it was sensible in that it allowed distant pastures um, in mountains and uplands to be taken advantage of in the summer when they did actually have good growth. And in the process of moving livestock away, um, up to these places for the summer, that then was advantageous at home because it allowed, it freed up space around the home farms um, for grass to grow, uh, which could then be cut as hay or left as winterage um, to be eaten while standing up in the winter months, or it could be left um, to free up more ground for, you know, cereal crops. So taking advantage of distant lands if you had access to them. Now, socially, you know, this is very important, obviously. It means that people had to move with livestock. And there's kind of a mixed picture as to who and how many people did move with livestock. We get some early hints in Ireland in a um, life of St. Kevin or St. Quivine. It was written in, um, well, there's various versions, but some versions were written in the 11th and um, early 12th centuries. And they refer to a kind of well-off farmer from uh, Midda, which is kind of in these lowlands here in the east of Ireland, and moving on a grazing circuit, Coort, Bultafish, um, to the Wicklow Mountains. And, well, it's a long story, and the aim of the story is to uh, tell um, loyal Christians how St. Kevin was found up in the wilderness, and how he was brought out of it, and um, convinced by God to found a monastery. But he was found basically because um, the cows that were brought up on transhumance were in a oak wood in a valley, Glendalough, um, and one cow ended up um, going and finding Kevin where he was hiding. And uh, because the cow licked the feet of St. Kevin, she had then had way more milk than all the rest of the cows, and they eventually discovered him. Um, but it's interesting because it it hints um, at what people might have expected as a normal farming practice at the time, even though the story is made up. And you can see clearly in this practice that it was a long distance movement uh, and the full family were going, um, you know, servants included. It was a big deal. Later on, uh, we do get some possible hints at that practice surviving of, you know, lots of people going. Um, in 1787 in Scotland, we're told um, by John Knox, who was visiting the Isle of Skye, that everybody had just gone up to the, the sheilings or the, the summer pastures by the time he had arrived. So he, he arrived on and found an empty village. And 
you have a similar kind of story from Achill Island a bit later then uh, from William Wilde who would have been uh, Oscar Wilde's father and he says that during the spring the entire population of several of the villages close their winter dwellings, drive the cattle before them and migrate into the hills. Um, but if you actually look at the results of archaeological survey, uh, in this case done by Teresa MacDonald um, in Achill Island, you can see that certainly for this period anyway that can't have been the case. Um, the entire population cannot have gone because there's a mismatch in the numbers of um, farmhouses and permanent dwellings and the number of uh, seasonal dwellings. So basically th there simply would not have been enough accommodation um, in the uplands, enough cabins and huts for everyone to have gone up. Uh, so he must have been exaggerating or just um, not fully informed. Um, this is an example from South Connemara, um, which I studied for my PhD. And here you can see kind of you know more cartographically how lowland coastal areas would have been linked with inland um, pastures. Um, so you can see here these um, linked townlands on Moss being linked with on Knofui and then on Ars here being linked with uh, Glunan. Uh, so these kind of um, detached territories that were linked together and uh, you can see again here obviously that looking at the green dots in the bottom left um, there's far more of those green dots, which are um, permanent houses, um, than there are uh, kind of summer huts, or booly huts as they might be called, uh, or brocky in this area. So um, I think what maybe the likes of John Knox and William Wilde were seeing in the 18th and 19th centuries was just the initial movement up to the summer pastures, uh, in which everybody would have gone in a kind of um, ceremonial movement almost. Uh, everybody would have gone up to the summer pastures and then most of them would have come back down again leaving only a certain segment of the community up there uh, for the duration of the summer and that's what I've tried to depict here in this kind of uh, basic diagram uh, everybody going up at the start and then uh, most going back down and in this later period the people who would have stayed up in the pastures by and large would have been um, would have been young people and especially young women. So it was a gender division of landscape, or gen sorry, gender division of labour, which is quite common, was quite common, uh, but kind of especially here, um, it was a gender division of labour which was kind of actually um, expressed in space as well, you know, it, it was expressed in the landscape with young, young people and young women especially being more likely to be up in the uplands uh, for the summer. Um, and this was partly linked, um, it was a pre-existing tradition, women, there's a long history of women uh, milking cows and also looking after cattle uh, going back to the medieval period, um, but the, um, I suppose, expansion uh, of their role in that um, aspect of animal husbandry, I wonder, may have um, expanded in the early medieval period onwards um, due to uh, context with the wider world and um, the increasing um, desire of people to produce a surplus of butter and cheese and milk which they could sell to the market um, so they may have been that labor may have been diverted more and more uh, to you know to animal husbandry um, so that communities could tap into those markets but that's a story for another day but at these seasonal settlements in uplands in Ireland and Scotland and elsewhere, um, we can see that it would have been, you know, in many cases it would have been girls that were at these sites. Um, but there was a certain amount of flexibility and, you know, adolescent boys could be up there too and also elderly women. So there was, there was definitely flexibility. In Scandinavia, well, this is even more famous in Scandinavia because the practice of transhumance actually continued up to recent times and even in some cases to this day, whereas it has not in Ireland and Scotland dying out in the 1940s. There in Scandinavia it's often highly romanticized, um, you know it's kind of it's in the national psyche almost and while it's romanticized it was actually a reality at summer farms as they call them in the mountains. Um, 
So in Sweden, for example, warfare would have drained a lot of men away from farm work in the you know in the 1600s especially. Uh, and again, also here there was growing interaction with markets. Um, so it would have been a predominantly, as you can see here, predominantly um, adolescent girls and you know, unmarried women as well, young unmarried women who would have been at the, these um, fabulder, as they call them in, in Swedish. So this kind of spatial fragmentation of the community is interesting because it, it raises a lot of questions really. Um, where Upland is a different cultural space, so as a result of this kind of um, this you know role that was given to young people, and because they were up there on their own, um, what does that mean for their independence in the community? Were they more independent than say um, young women or young people would have been uh, fifty years later? You know, in, in the middle of the twentieth century. So first to the you know the question of the otherness of summer pastures, whether they were a different cultural space. To some extent, this is borne out by um, the archaeological, um, I suppose, survey results. Um, just looking at some of these actual cabins or huts that people would have lived in, these, these bully sites. Um, so there's difficulties, obviously, not all of them have been excavated, so the dating of them uh, isn't fully established. Um, but it does seem that there is a tendency to maybe have kind of different forms of dwelling and that people were kind of innovating in terms of how they designed these cabins um, in the landscape. So they were taking advantage of natural features in the landscape, building up against banks of streams, building up against boulders and willing to adapt what would have been a normal dwelling space to that landscape. Um, you know, rectangular structures being normal at the time. Uh, in Sweden, they're a bit more standard. They are. Um, they do seem to follow this kind of square rectangular layout. These summer cabins, but nevertheless, they are definitely smaller. Um, so there is a sense that people lived in a different type of dwelling space when they were up there. Also, um, you know, as we mentioned, you can definitely see that there is a, a kind of a sense of otherness in many of the folk tales about summer pastures. Um, so, for example, as well as these ones I mentioned, there is a folktale type uh, robbers and the captive girl, which is common across Northern Europe, um, but is um, you know often especially related to life in summer pastures. And you know, it, it um, I suppose it does speak to a sense of otherness in the uplands because in many cases, um, strange things actually happen. And um, for example, you have cases of often of three strange men arriving onto these sites at night time uh, when there was maybe only one woman or one girl left in the hut. And uh, in many of the stories, you know, it ends up with uh, the woman or the girl coming out on top. Um, in one case, uh, the woman actually um, kills one of the men who pokes his head in the door, beats him over the head. Um, in another case, uh, the girl manages to hide in the corner and uh, three witches come in, or Kailacha come in and cast a spell over the three men who had arrived in um, to warm themselves at the fire. And uh, the young girl knew the, the spell and uh, she was able to lift it um, by uttering this line. Um, but before she did, before she freed the, the three men, um, she demanded effectively that one of them, uh, the best looking of them, would marry her. Um, so there's kind of a sense that, um, you know, that maybe in some cases, um, you know, women did have a bit more independence than they might normally have had. Um, but the kind of sense of danger in there is, you know, you've got to remember that a lot of these stories were narrated um, to um, ethnographers by elderly men who would have been telling their perspective. And their perspective was one which did not come from um, the herding in the uplands. They weren't the ones doing it. So, you know, in some cases, maybe they were telling actually more cautionary tales and deliberately exaggerating dangers um, so that women wouldn't um, misbehave or just, you know, uh, come to harm, basically. 
in reality, um, in reality, when you look at some other accounts which actually come directly from herders and which are more about reminiscences rather than um, folk tales, um, you can see that actually these places would have been, uh, you know, important for recreation. The Shanukal or proverb, Hukshi and Dausa or Vula Lehi, um, she was well schooled in dancing, um, but literally it means she brought the dance from the Guli. Uh, so that indicates how important these places were for learning dance and song. Um, there's also, you know, possibility of um, social freedom and, you know, unsupervised uh, courtship taking place. Um, that's clearer in Scandinavia, to be honest. Um, it's not as clear in Ireland and Scotland. But you have some few hints of it anyway, at least in, in Irish language and uh, Scottish Gaelic. So, for example, um, in Scottish Gaelic, you have this verse, Hugmi Iha Nurir Sonari, Hugmi Iha Nurir Sonari, Ispimi Nucht, Gukril, Quivnil, Mari, Maiden, and Nahari. So, um, I spent last night at the Shielding basically, and tonight I'll be warm and gentle uh, in the Shielding Maiden's company. So, it seems very kind of. Um, you know, nice and romanticized, but there is a play on words in there, I think, uh, in that uh, Nucht, um, meaning tonight, uh, is a double entendre and, and can also mean uh, naked. Um, there's Alalu um, you know, a very kind of romanticized song in Irish about a young woman who is kind of reminiscing about her days in the summer pastures um, that's sung to this day. And also one which um, I think probably Lillis would be familiar with. Um Vermsham of Alacht, the Dasagart U de Fosme, Custom Te Dardig Nabaltamura, near Vid Shu de Klachme Idu Smoiga, Ocha Greek or Natanakit, Ishnagona Dark Yola. So this is um again spoke this is spoken from a female perspective. A woman cursing um the priest who married her, uh, and the man who brought her to the uh, big town. Uh, they were not the ones who taught me in my youth uh, when I was dancing on the pastures with the the, the older calves or the yearlings. So you know it's it's um, obviously memories turn turn to gold, but nevertheless there is a hint that uh, there was a, a hidden history of recreation up there. Um, so I'll just go quickly through this last um, section. Uh, there's also some hints of you know, in the archaeology of limits on the independence of young herders. Um, so, for example, with that movement of people up to the summer pastures at the start of summer, um, it was actually tended to be the brothers and fathers of these herders who actually repaired the huts for the um, girls, uh, both in Sweden and also in, in Ireland. Um, so, you know, you could argue that they're kind of, um, you know, symbolically kind of vouchsafing protection for them. And then as well in the use of space around uh, these sites, they actually kind of echo the permanent settlements to some extent. You have, you know, potato cultivation um, on a small scale and also some, some walls around them, um, which appear to echo the kind of organize, organization of space. Um, at home. Then in the wider landscape around the actual the huts themselves you would also have had other activities going on. You know these places were not very far away um, they were only you know sometimes only two or three kilometers away from the homesteads max 12 kilometers you know 12 13 kilometers so there were other activities going on in the wider landscape um, you know industrial and extractive activities that would have been undertaken by uh, men who came up from the home. So in Sweden, you would have had, you know, iron production and, um, you know, also hunting of of, uh, of elk and haymaking. Um, this is Carl Linnaeus uh, visiting uh, a place in Dalarna and saying that everybody had gone up um, to visit the Sheelings um, because they wanted to make hay around uh, the meadows in the forests and then they came back down and as well of course as people would know in Ireland and Scotland there would have been a lot of uh, cutting of turf or peat 
um, in the uplands. So this meant that people, you know, men would have been up around these places um, within view shot or earshot of um, of the women who were acting as herders. And moreover, these uplands, these commons, um, while they were, I suppose, places of cooperation between different families and um, tenant house tenant households, they were also places that were were governed. And governance was important because uh, not everybody was equal, and certain families had certain grazing rights, and others had other grazing rights. So there were community arbiters who, it seems, oversaw the distribution of grazing rights up to the late 1800s, and. We can see this in County Tyrone. There would have been a Macedor um, who oversaw these grazing rights. Um, also in uh, Donegal and Connemara, you have uh, references to uh, a Brehav or a kind of a judge, a local unofficial judge who would have overseen grazing rights. So in North Connemara, Drihi Dogwood Hainaka, the A Raymond Shoiga on Brehav, a Viachaka. So they used to have their own laws. Raymond Shoiga was the judge or the brehav that they had. Um, so uplands were part of a wider society, and you know the idea that people would have had total independence for six months of the year through this practice um, isn't really the case. They were part of a wider society which was patriarchal and which was concerned with um, keeping livestock safe and producing a surplus of butter. Um, so they were never disconnected. Um, so I'll leave it there. I went a bit over time, sorry. Um, if you want to find out a bit more about kind of bullying in an Irish context, um, I published a book last year. Um, there's a discount code there for it, um, um, BB145 on the uh, Bydell and Brewer's website. And also a bit more detail, I go into a bit more detail as well on the kind of um, the role of female herders um, in a few articles. They're all up online. If you just Google female herding, um, you'll, you'll find them. They're all up there as PDFs. So, Grimila Margriff.